So, I'm Heather Smith. I'm the chair of the Coalition for Community Energy and I am so glad to see you all today. To see you all online. Um, big uh, hello to everyone who, who's joined us online today. A huge hello to the 15 remote hubs um, that have gathered together in their communities um, to be part of uh, the Community Energy Congress. We are meeting here today in the ICC on uh, the Gadigal lands. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, but also the traditional owners of lands. And you can see we are all around Australia today. And I wanted to reflect quickly on why we meet. People have been gathering for millennia. In Stonehenge, um, people came from all over the British Isles. They travelled for weeks to gather at the solstice. But we are honoured to live and work on a country where people have been gathering perhaps for 80,000 years, one of the continuous oldest continuous living cultures in, on the globe. Um, and we meet because we share, we learn, we refresh old relationships and we make new ones. And I, I hope that that is what we um, will achieve over the next two days. So without further ado, I am going to pass to Stefan. Stefan joins us from Germany. He um, has driven the World Wind Energy Association for 25 years. The World Wind Energy Association is not the big corporate one. Its, its roots are in community energy. It's in the smaller communities that were building wind turbines back in the 80s, the 90s, maybe even the 70s. And um, Stefan is also the chair of um, the International Renewable Energy Agency's uh, Community Energy Working Group. Hello, Stefan. Welcome. Uh, hey, very did you hear, good morning. Did you hear my introduction of you? Yes, thank you very much. That was Great. a very kind one, and I'm very pleased to be with you now. So um, please take us away and, um, and tell us a bit about the community energy sector that we join that exists all around the world. Yeah, what, what I, what I uh, want to in, in, in the short time that I have, of course, of course I know there is enough to speak days about the importance of what we meet at such meetings. Um, I want to start with this slide, which you may wonder why is he starting with the development of large wind turbines over the last 40 years or more than 40 years. It's not just because we just uh, uh, gathered those statistics and we just came out with those uh, number that in the year 2023, uh, the world has now achieved more than 1 million megawatt. But please be aware that most of this is based on initiatives, bottom up and communities. You've already mentioned uh, that the technology even was developed by community groups. That even started before 1980 when the first megawatt wind turbine in Denmark was installed, the megawatt turbine, which is still in operation. Communities, of course, a lot in Europe, but also in other continents, they started to develop, they started to invest farmers, cooperatives, etc. So wind power today looks like a big industry and there are of course big companies today but this only is possible because of the community energy groups the citizens that build this they put pressure on politicians to create the right policy frameworks etc so what we see of course at the moment is a is a shift as a consequence of this it's not anymore like small groups which are doing this it's a really global movement which is changing the energy landscape from a centralized fossil and nuclear based uh, energy supply system to a decentralized one. And you in Australia are doing a fantastic job, of course, uh, 
many of your houses have now solar rooftops. I think you are number one worldwide. But this is, of course, not only for houses, it's also for small villages, etc. But that goes, of course, hand in hand with also different ways, economic structures. And we can see this in many parts of the world. And first, we didn't even have a name for that. Um, so uh, we also talking to people from around the world, we noticed how important that just the term, we start using community power, which maybe has a little bit more a political implication, community energy, community power is the same, but this is really describing what this all is about. And then around 10, 15 years ago, uh, we gathered, we started working explicitly on this area. We had a World Wind Energy Conference in Canada in uh, 2008 with the main theme of community power we then decided we even need a definition of what community power is. And community power, we came to three elements for that definition. It's ownership, it's about control, and it's about who gets the benefits. And we said that if two out of these three, the majority stays with the local community, then we call it community power. That's also important because what happens in other areas, what we call greenwashing, should happen in, in the area of community energy. It's important that when we talk about community energy, people know what it means. Control and ownership, that is what it is about. Community power, without being explicitly at the beginning called as such, is a mainstream in some countries. My home country in Germany, it's still the, the main group is of investors is cooperatives, it's local companies, it's farmers, which are uh, investing much, much more than the big utilities. In Denmark also, it's still a mainstream model that mainly, of course, for onshore wind, it's uh, built by cooperatives. And we see this now many parts around the world. There's also Japan, for example, but also more and more in the so-called developing country. Please be aware, although I've just now suggested a definition of what community energy, community power is. Community power is diverse. You have small, medium, large companies, entities which are doing it. It's all technologies. It can be solar, wind, it can also be bioenergy or hydropower. It can be about producing for your own consumption. It can be what we call now energy sharing that you share within your community or with your neighbors. It can be in the form of cooperatives, different legal entities are possible. Uh, it's very interesting you look at this rural community energy. I think that's more where it started. That's mainly farmers, but there's also urban community energy nowadays, often with solar cooperatives, for example. It's also important to understand this is not something only for industrialized or for the so-called developing countries. It's in different forms can be found everywhere. And of course, in these so-called developing countries, it's a lot about energy access, how people can get energy access and can get best benefits out of energy access. And it's the, the profit that's generated from a project, from an investment, is staying within those communities and can be reinvested because that can really give a boost to economic development. Also, gender aspect is something that you find in, in some countries, for example, in Japan, we've come across uh, women-only uh, cooperatives. So there are some projects which explicitly are supporting also gender equity. I think it's really important to bear that in mind. It's very diverse. So that has a kind of also social benefit, cultural benefit for every person that is part of such a community. But also when we look at this transformation, which we the world is now undergoing, the switch from fossil nuclear to renewable energy, we also see that it's very, very important because community power is an accelerator. I give you one concrete example. We've come across, we did a survey uh, a while ago, a bottleneck in building wind farms nowadays is the planning and permitting process. Average, it takes uh, worldwide more than five years to build a wind farm. But we know very well, and that's part of our recommendations, where you have people involved on the local level, where you have people that are driving it, then, of course, there are less barriers. 
and it's easier to find the good solutions. So also in that sense, to accelerate that which, which now, because of the urgency of the climate crisis, is now more urgent than ever before. Community power is not something that some people may believe takes more time. No, it's rather the opposite. And I can tell you also, I'm also personally a, a, a member of supervisory board of a, a cooperative. Um, we can do projects quite fast. I think an important question that you're probably going to discuss as well, which policies are good for community power to evolve? And the first answer I'll give is most important, it should be non-discriminatory. Because what we see today is in some countries, suddenly it's, or it's very difficult for smaller investors, especially community-based investors to be part of the market. A very good example are these auctions. We had in Europe feed-in tariffs where everybody could participate and you knew you would get your remuneration, but auctions with the high risk are definitely not included. So that is of course a very specific case, but if you go to your politicians, your policy makers, ask them, we want to have the same market opportunities like large investors as well. Very interesting is a more recent trend that more and more jurisdictions now come to that point that they introduce community power legislation to kind of oblige those investors to offer some kind of community engagement. That's more than information sharing. It's in many more, many cases, it's also about ownership, co-ownership. I think that's something really important and we have to see how this will develop because I think policy makers do understand more and more how important it is that the local citizens are part of the projects. On the global level as World Wind Energy Association, we are trying to put this on the agenda, which is not always so easy because as you can imagine, for example, International Renewable Energy Agency, the guys who are meeting there are usually from the big international corporations because they can afford to go to such meetings and uh, they have staff to just work with those organizations. But as you mentioned, we have fortunately this community energy group, which has already come out with three white papers. And I'm quite happy about that uh, because that describes in these three publications that we have our community energy work so that the governments, the members of ARENA can refer to that and also get some knowledge. Recently, we, we noticed that indeed there is an increasing interest. So it's not so much ARENA itself, but the member states who are asking for such advice. And we are at the moment, I think that's uh, something that will be really important. Uh, we are at the moment working on a white paper, which always takes of course, a lot of time when you work in an international organization that is highlighting in particular the benefits that come from community energy. I hope we can launch this uh, white paper in the next uh, well, months. Um, and I really, of course, when you work on the ground, that sounds a little bit abstract for you, but I believe that with this arena kind of stamp on it, it will also have authority. And it is not so easy, but we've managed with that to also discuss the topic, which is seems to be a local topic on the international agenda. So what I see as our future is, we will have a combination in the future, 100% renewables, I think in Australia, needless to say, it's a new normal. We have the symphony of the renewables, all the renewables will play a role, but that also embedded in local ownership, strong local ownership, community power. That is the vision that I have uh, for the future. And I'm very happy that I could now give this, and it's a great honor that I could give this first speech at your event. And I wish you very fruitful discussions, um, inspiring discussions, and that you can progress on the way to such a future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. And um, we're going to get Stefan to stay on the line for uh, uh, 10 minutes or so. So get those questions into him. We're going to let him come back and answer the two best questions. Um, so so um, pop your questions in the Q&A. 
So back to me now, um, and I am going to uh, acknowledge firstly uh, the Victorian Government and particularly the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action. They um, uh, gave us the, the prompt and the support right when we needed it to make the big decision, do we try to make this a hybrid event or not? Um, and so, as well as that, we get a bonus, we get welcomed by the, one of the longest serving energy ministers in Australia. I believe Lily D'Ambrosio gets it. Um, and uh, we had her at our 2017 Congress. We'd like to think that that's part of how we got support, um, good support in Victoria for community energy. We'd love to see that around Australia. Over to Lily. Hello everyone and thank you to the Coalition for Community Energy for inviting me to speak with you today as part of this year's Community Energy Congress. I'm recording today in Melbourne and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Congress is taking place, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'm very pleased to see the Community Energy Congress being held again and with the Victorian Government as a supporter and participant. The energy transition we're undertaking is an enormous task and presents so many opportunities for people and communities across Victoria and the country. Victoria is proudly a nation leader in empowering households and communities through distributed energy resources. Our Solar Homes program has helped more than 320,000 Victorian households and businesses install rooftop solar or battery systems. We're rolling out a network of public electric vehicle charging stations and supporting new charging technologies that will extend the benefits of EVs to more Victorians. We've installed some of the first neighbourhood batteries in the country through our Neighbourhood Battery Initiative. And we've built on that success with our 100 Neighbourhood Batteries Program, which will support communities across Victoria to install neighbourhood batteries of all sizes and functions to unlock more rooftop solar, build grid resilience and lower energy bills. We know that energy storage at the household, neighbourhood and grid scale is critical to supporting our renewable energy transition. That's why we currently have a bill in the Victorian Parliament to legislate our energy storage targets of at least 2.6 gigawatts by 2030 and at least 6.3 gigawatts by 2035. There are numerous programs that we're delivering to support these targets, but ultimately we need people and communities to come with us and be part of the energy transition in order for it to succeed. Events like the Community Energy Congress are a great opportunity to connect, to share ideas and spark conversations about how people can participate in and benefit from the energy transition. So I hope you all enjoy the Community Energy Congress. I encourage you to keep working together to support community participation in the energy transition and deliver the solutions that will take us into our renewable energy future. Thank you and good luck. I get to do the third welcome and I'd like to take you for a quick run through our agenda. I'm really excited. We're looking forward to it and it gives me an opportunity to acknowledge all of our wonderful sponsors. Um, and you've, you've had a bit of a vision from, um, from uh, Stefan and a bit from Lily there. Um, now you get a bit of mine. So tomorrow is mainly the day we're doing what is community energy. Um, we've got a great Electrify Everything session and I'd really like to thank Reclaim Energy, um, heat pump uh, manufacturers who came on board voluntarily, really when we needed the, the oomph to get this, this um, event up and running, and Trina Solar. There's lots of solar manufacturers downstairs um, at the expo, but Trina are the ones that have come to support us and we are really grateful for their support. Um, the, and, and one of the things we've been fond of saying is uh, 
community energy works at every scale, from the household scale right up to the biggest renewables. And Squadron Energy have been with us since the start of this journey. Um, we wouldn't have even uh, committed to doing the event without them. And we know that they've done some wonderful work um, with teams like Community Power Agency in the past, making those uh, wind farms work well. And um, we've got a, a, a great wrap-up session. Um, well, no, sorry, we've got a, a great microgrids, batteries and control session um, tomorrow as well. And, you know, what we do at the community scale is actually um, something that I think we are watching more closely than maybe even um, the energy sector itself. And there's a lot of problems to solve at the community scale, and when we do it at the community scale, we make our communities better, we make those energy systems serve our communities. And we will wrap up tomorrow, oh, I forgot to, forgot to, a sponsor there, ARENA. ARENA already know the people um, in that uh, microgrids and batteries session because of course they've helped fund a lot of those projects and they know that we're out there innovating. Um, and we're wrapping up tomorrow with um, a wonderful reflection on resilience, equity and justice, of course. Those are the things a lot of us want for our communities. Today is more about how do we get there. And uh, one of our themes is everyone pulling in the same direction would be nice. Uh, so, you know, I'm really pleased that Community Power Agency, Smart Energy Council, Rewiring Australia, have all joined us in partner, as partners in this event, helped us get off the ground. Um, the big session at 12 o'clock, uh, imagining the future, we're really looking forward to that. What, having a shared vision of the future is gonna help us get there, obviously. Um, but we don't do that unless we all talk. And we can't leave the technocrats and the bureaucrats talking to each other and leaving us out of the story. And I can be a bit of a technocrat too, and I'm looking at the amount of renewable energy we will throw away unless we transform our homes and the way we use energy and our businesses and the smarts we put in place. And it, once we put smarts in place, we're controlling things. And once we control things, we need governance systems. And the community energy sector is in there experimenting and doing that sort of work. Straight after the vision session, we're going to be talking about learning what works by telling our stories. And I'm really pleased um, that we've, uh, we've, we've worked with the Climate Media Centre as a supporter. We've got Anne Delaney, and give a, give a wave there, um, as the chair for our, our vision session from Switched On. And we're looking forward to getting lots and lots of community energy stories in Switched On as we go forward. The reason there's a big question mark on finance and partnerships, that's going to be our big wow session at the end of today, inspire everyone. The way you go fast is you channel the resources in the right direction. And we do a good job of channeling volunteer resources. We do a good job of collaborating, but we don't always have the finance. But we've got a group of wonderful stories. The question mark is that's, that's a space open there for a sponsor. So, so just bear that in mind if you're from the finance industry. And last but definitely not least, um, we're about to go into our Community Energy Icons session. What One of the wonderful things Community Energy does is we learn, we experiment, we learn again. We're about to hear from three um, really important uh, groups who've been in the game for a long time about what they've learnt. And I would really like to acknowledge Rosetta Analytics. Rosetta have a, um, I'm just trying to work out where their banner is, a banner here about their network portal. One of the ways we learn is with data. They have a wonderful data portal where you can download data from um, any generator, uh, any large scale generator instantly, make it really easy for us to collect the information we need in our communities to help um, invent this future that we're inventing together. So without further ado, I'm going to go back to Stefan. Now I gave Stefan to, um, uh, can we flick back to Stefan please? I gave him the instruction to answer up to the two best questions. 
Stefan, did you look at Slido and were there any good questions there? Yes, yes, and I think they are all related. Um, I see now there are two uh, front runners if you want. Um, what is an example of non-discrimination policy? What does it look like in action? And I think what policies do you see helping community energy the most in Europe? Uh, that's kind of uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, let me say, I think it's it's in, in Europe, it's all related to EU legislation, if you want. Um, I've mentioned already that the introduction of the auctions really, and that was an EU kind of uh, legislation, um, that really created big problems. As I said, I'm personally also a, a member of the supervisory board of, an, of a, uh, a cooperative. For example, we cannot take that risk of now planning a wind farm and spending half a million or one million, um, and then uh, maybe we will not succeed in the auctions. Uh, that's a very big problem in the past that worked. Um, at the same time, remuneration in the auctions is now higher than with the old feed-in tariff. That's certainly a one example of a big problem. We see now the, another side that's also related, also from EU legislation, that's the availability of land, public land, because that's now also based on kind of auction system. Um, those who offer most money for the land, they can build the wind farm there. But these are usually foreign investors, international investors, which are not then bringing additional value to the local community. And that is again keeping community-based investors out. So this kind of, there must be a different way how uh, the policies are dealing with this, what is maximizing the benefit. And I would say, um, you can see that's then also related with, there was another question, uh, how uh, uh, permitting processes can take less time, because I give you a concrete example. There was just a referendum, held a local referendum at a place where a French company wanted to build a wind farm in Bavaria. And the land was given to this investor only because they bought, uh, they offered most money for it. And then the people in the community refused that wind farm. And now they need to do a second round. While there was a referendum held one week later at another place, which was driven by the local cooperative and that succeeded. I think that's a very simple way. The other wind farm will also be built one day, but it will take maybe one, two years longer while the people in the village who want that, they now enforced it and it will just happen. And uh, maybe the last answer to this, what is really uh, now interesting on the European level is uh, what is called energy sharing. Uh, that is now in several countries working well, which means that, for example, a cooperative uh, can um, give the electricity from the wind farm that is owned by the cooperative to its members without extra taxes, levies, etc. So that is bringing the prices down for consumers who join a cooperative and may also uh, uh, reduce the the uh, uh, grid operation cost, and that starts to become a major driver as well. I think that's an important, rather new tool because many uh, member states are not fully yet uh, putting it into national law. But that energy sharing would be another kind of um, uh, term that I would mention here as an important. Um, uh Okay, I'm going to wind you up there, Stefan, because we are running late and uh, we're going to let you go to bed. It's very late in Germany. Thank you so much for joining us. That is us. true. And, Thank um, you so much. <laughs>